setting with Iowa Organic Association. If you guys don't already know who I am, I am uh, the Education and Outreach Coordinator for Iowa. So what we'll do here today, there's quite a few more people that are RSVP to this meeting, so I am anticipating that they will be joining us later and we'll allow them to trickle into the meeting as the meeting progresses. But um, what we'll do uh, is we will uh, start with a little presentation by myself that will talk about IOA or just five little slides. And then once that is done, Jude, Jude will um, present his presentation. And then uh, at the end of the meeting, we'll have a Q&A portion of the event where you are welcome to unmute yourself and ask those questions. Or if you uh, feel so, um, you are also welcome to add your uh, questions into the chat box and I uh, can ask those questions as I, you know, after Jude is done presenting. So that will be the format uh, questions at the end. Uh, however, if they pop into your mind and you want to ask them in the chat box, feel free to do so. You're welcome to do so. Um, just wanted to say thank you to Jude, of course, he is uh, our presenter today. We're so excited to have him um, present on this, you know, very important topic that is, uh, um, you know, extremely important to our livestock producers and um, really excited to learn more about that. And then, of course, thank you to each and every one of you for being here today and taking time out of your busy weeks to be here and be part of our webinar. Um, so without further ado, I will go ahead and share my quick presentation. Okay, just one minute, I need to find it. All right, here it goes. Okay, just give me a thumbs up if you see my presentation. Thumbs up, okay, perfect. All right. Okay, well, thank you guys again for being here today. Um, as you know, uh, or maybe don't, Iowa was established in 2006, and we are a statewide nonprofit organization committed to organic education, advocacy, and community operation. Our mission is to advance organic agriculture in the state of Iowa. Uh, our members represent a diverse community of Iowa's organic farmers, gardeners, food and farm businesses, um, advocates and consumers who are champions for the organic movement. Uh, our top priorities are listed on this slide. Um, they represent education, outreach, advocacy, and community. And to touch briefly on them, um, with education, what we do is provide programs um, such as uh, the webinar today, um, expertise and information to help expand and diversify organic opportunities in Iowa. Um, some of the uh, things that we have done are, are growing organic expertise uh, webinars this year. They are geared towards technical uh, service providers to help them um, help farmers interested to transition to organic agriculture. We also have organized the Midwest Organic Poor Conference, one of its kind. Uh, of course, in 2020 was canceled due to COVID. So um, uh, we are thankful that Jude Becker is able to join us today to share one of the topics that would have been presented at that conference in 2020. And then another thing that we of course do are on farm field days and uh, of course, webinars um, that you are part of today. Um, as far as our outreach is concerned, our goal is to connect with target audiences and the public to promote research events and resources that are beneficial to our organic community. We always partake in conferences, trade shows, and any other community events. Um, um, you can find a plethora of resources on our website and e-news, our calendar, uh, social media, and our list serves. So if you don't already follow us, please do so. We'd love to uh, have you join us um, via those avenues. Um, as far as advocacy is concerned, uh, we always work with state level leadership uh, to you know, help with policies that are dedicated 
uh, to funding and supporting Iowa's growing organic industry. Um, and, and as far as community is concerned, uh, we are all about a culture of collaboration. Um, we are always trying to connect experts in the organic industry, such as Jude, uh, with stakeholders and resources to strengthen our uh, Iowa's organic community. Uh, one of the things that we are proud uh, to have available to you and anyone else uh, that may come across our website is our Iowa Organic Resource Directory. Um, in this particular directory, we have over 900 businesses, nonprofits, and service providers that are uh, associated with the organic um, industry. Um, it, it is meant to uh, offer anyone that is a transitioning uh, farmer or any, anyone that may need assistance in finding some of these resources. It, it's a great valuable tool for our organic community to achieve growth and continued success within the organic industry. And actually, you guys, we are completely out of the hard copies at the moment. However, you are still able to access one of these directories in a PDF format format on our website under the resources tab. So I welcome you to do so. Of course, as a nonprofit organization, we rely heavily on your membership and support uh, in order for us to build a strong community. We need to have your support and are grateful uh, to each and every one of you for being here today and for supporting us um, in any way, shape or form. Of course, uh, more information on membership and uh, uh, you, you know, is uh, found on our website. You can always connect with either myself or Roz via our email or the phone number listed here. Uh, always happy to hear from you guys. And that concludes my presentation. Uh, so with that being said, Jude, if you uh, can go ahead and get started, that would be great. Thank you, Thank you so much. Okay. So I think I've got my screen shared now, and I just have to go back, like you said here. So I guess I think I think it's working. So if if, if it looks like my screen is showing up, just okay, good. I see a thumbs up from Olga. So thank you, Olga, for your um, uh, overview of the important work of the Iowa Organic Association. Um, I know it's been important to me over the years. So thanks again. Uh, so like Olga said, uh, my name is Jude Becker. I have a farm near Dyersville, and we've been organic since 1999 here, or I have. And uh, chief among the, the multiple enterprises that we have on the farm is pig production. And over the years, I've sort of built up my own brand name called Becker Lane Organic. And uh, one of the main things in doing that has always been this sort of you know, like practical and intellectual and sort of just farming puzzle that is everlastingly present in terms of how do we use the animal. And so the first slide I've got here is that this is not a new problem. Um, this has been depicted in art and literature going back um, through, you know, this is a late Middle Ages uh, oil painting showing everyone in the village working together to use the pig carcass. And it's an important thing because whether you're a farmer who has nothing to do with, at least you might think you have nothing to do with uh, utilizing the carcass, uh, someone somewhere along the line has to do this very important work. And because I've done direct marketing, it's, it's sort of forced upon me over the years, this, this, um, this part of farming that some people don't think of when they raise pigs. Um, so basically what I want to talk about today is how, how I've gone about building this up and how I make it work. The current, the most current iteration of my, my marketing uh, system and, and carcass use. Um, we, have, we have a bi-weekly uh, production system on the farm. And that basically means every two weeks, I have a designated day at the packing plant that cooperates with me. And that's sort of my day. And because that packing plant is not certified organic only for, you know, for me, they're certified organic for, for a few producers. However, 
the producers that are there are all um, being processed. Their hogs are processed the very first thing in the morning. So in other words, that's one important thing that, that the plant does is clean itself up overnight for their normal uh, quality assurance protocols. And so the first thing in the morning, they have my pigs, my organic pigs there ready to be processed. And we do a Tuesday, while well, we send the hogs from the farm on Monday, the pigs are then ready to be killed on Tuesday and the pork is cut on Wednesday. So we do that once in two weeks. Uh, I do it once in two weeks, although I have to concede my customers would like a more frequent uh, harvesting schedule, the farm is not big enough. And if I were doing it every, every week, the challenges for me would be it, the, the intensity level uh, for me would be too high. Also, the shipping costs would basically double. And as you know, the shipping cost for sending meat any kind of distance is very significant to consider as a factor. Therefore, you know, we've been able to sort of have the best of both worlds by training our customers to accept that they need to order fresh meat once in two weeks. So enough meat for two weeks, basically. Um, and I've over time, one, one thing that I'll talk about today is um, to think how, how I think about this. In other words, I've had to teach myself to, to change expectations and sort of root out or discover these hidden and often not think about stereotypes and assumptions I, I've, I've held as a farmer. And so what is my outlook? My outlook now is I'm making food, okay? So I'm I'm a pork producer in, in the literal sense of the word. I'm producing meat that's fresh, uh, vacuum packed in a box, in a bag that can be delivered to your restaurant or your grocery store uh, at many places. And that's how I view every decision. So that outlook um, lets me focus on basically a, a, a part of a production cycle and looking at the farm as, as, a, as a complete organism that at the end, we have a, an amazingly uh, good tasting gourmet quality meat product that helps my customers be very happy and also teaches them through my repetitive communication to respect all the um, components of the farm system, which leads that meat product to their door. So if, but if I, when I was just starting this 20 years ago, I thought of myself only as a pig producer. And that I, I found was important, but it's kind of one-sided because when I was that way, I thought only about how many pigs I produce, how much the pigs weighed, what was their back fat level, what was their percent lean. Uh, and actually I didn't think that much about the food chain that left that started at, that started after the pigs left my farm's door, and and it so it, I think trying to the first thing you need to think about when you think about direct marketing is your outlook and trying to have an outlook uh, focused and oriented on food, not just farming pigs. Uh, so again, those those may seem like divergent philosophies, but just just to be just to hit the point a little bit more. Um, if you focus on the farm only as production, what has this led to in the past? We have an entire culture in the Midwest of farmers who have become essentially just uh, the lowest sort of common denominator or you know lo low cost producer of how can we make the most protein, the most the cheapest protein source, and you know you've all heard of the other white meat concept, which I think illustrates perfectly the sort of self-destruction that the pork industry has undergone in the past, let's say, four or five decades. And there has been this sort of cycle of overproduction followed by very poor prices, and that leads to economic insustainability for farmers and a mass exodus of small, small pork producers, um, which we all, we all can talk about. We all know that, so I won't go too much more into that. But on, you know, on the right side of the slide, I felt I feel as if my history in the past 20 years has has been trying to focus on making food. So by doing that, I know from experience I've created more abundance for the farm. 
uh, a greater degree of, of choice and, and uh, higher quality food product for, for my customers. And not, not only has that led to, to economic health, but it's led, I feel, to, to animal welfare, to, to health. I know I get personal uh, calls and emails frequently from customers who, beyond being satisfied with the value from a price and taste standpoint, they feel like they're getting a healthy meat product. I recently, we just had a, a woman contact us from California indicating her satisfaction because her kids were having allergies and they couldn't eat any meat. And when they ate my organic pork, they, they, she said it was the first meat they were able to eat and not, and not get sick. So that really rewards me personally and lets me know there's, there's a greater value out here in, in doing this work in the long term. Um, so again, to be a little bit philosophical, um, I like to think that before you set out on the road to making a direct marketing plan for your farm, you need to sit down with yourself, maybe on a, on a boring rainy day or snowy day in winter and, and try to figure out um, what are, what do you expect out of your farm's meat marketing program? Do you, maybe some people expect that they can focus all their time on, on, you know, the animal husbandry side of their farm. And certainly that's important. Um, may, maybe you enjoy the public relations, relations side of this. Maybe you, maybe you like going out and meeting your customers and interacting with them and listening to their, their needs and their stories. And, and either one of those things is fine. And, and my, my path has been sort of a middle, middle path trying to balance those two concepts of to make my farm work from an animal husbandry standpoint, as well as um, learning about what my customers want um, for, for their pork and their, their, their food and their meat, their meat choices. Um, so again, that inf has influenced my attitude as a farmer, what I expect and to be realistic about what I expect and having the right, the right level of um, planning to meet, to get those expectations to become reality. And also the last thing that it takes is commitment. Once you start uh, a direct marketing program and trying to direct market your own farm's um, meat products, it takes a long time. Like I'll tell you right now, it's taken us many years to get where we are in terms of uh, brand recognition. And it probably is an ongoing process for many more years. So you really have to commit yourself to it. Uh, and so basically, one, one of the first things you need beyond the farm gate, if, if you have a farm producing pigs and you think, what do I need to, to start making a plan to market this product? Really, even before you have customers, you have to find a packing plant or a, a meat processor, locker plant, uh, et cetera, which is as close as you can, can uh, find it to your farm. Uh, and, but also, Equally important to that is um, you need to have close cooperation. Uh, they need to be willing to work with you. So what, what does that mean? Uh, that has been, I'll just confess, quite challenging for us in the last few years. And I know I'm sure uh, if we had a round table, we could discuss the difficulty of the, the limited number of packing companies out there and, and and locker plants who are booked out one or more years in advance. And, you know, we could, we could tell stories like that all day long. But one thing that, that I find is quite important once you find a, a processor who wants to work with your farm and cooperate with you is they need to offer, um, basically a, you need to prepare yourself to offer fresh pork. And then you need to think about how you're gonna get the pork from that plant to your customers. Um, and so the little diagram here shows what that might look like um, at my place. I can just tell you that we use a plant in Northwest Iowa called SIG International, S-I-G, SIG. And the pigs leave my farm on a Monday morning and, and go pretty far. It's five hours from my place in Dyersville to Boyd in Iowa. Um, but it, we make it work. I have a very good truck driver who, who's very um, conscientious about animal welfare on the truck and the transit time. Uh, and so we make it work and the pigs arrive sometime late on Monday and they are overnighted and rested before processing, before killing on Tuesday morning. 
And then on Wednesday, the pork is, is the carcasses are broken down and cut. And on Thursday, the pork leaves SIG and goes wherever. And I've been able to work with a number of LTL carriers in the state of Iowa on that sort of shipping and distribution side to get pork to where it has to go. And we send our pork to primarily Northern California to two distribution points that work with me for making further, further deliveries. Uh, we also send pork to Asia. Um, unexpectedly over the years, we've had chefs who had, had uh, visited stores or butcher shops or restaurants in the Bay Area become customers and then sort of request my pork in Asia. So I've learned how to send pork fresh by air freight to Hong Kong and Tokyo. Um, so again, this sort of working out the logistics is really important and you need to need to not be afraid to ask questions and uh, call up, you know, just make cold calls like I did to some, to some of these freight companies and start asking questions about how learning how to send the pork around and uh, it take it takes some it takes time. So another things another thing that's really important in terms of parameters of this of this program or any program the direct market pork is you need customers then once you have the plant and once you have the 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 trucking figured out then you need to sort of make that work make that fit in with your customers and the most important thing of these customers that I find in terms of desirable traits is they need to share your philosophy they need to believe in animal welfare uh, stewardship of the landscape, uh, meat quality, and, and for me, organic farming, because I, I need to be able to convince my customers that certified organic as a label is worth the investment. So, and here, this is just a photo of a chef in Chicago that I happen to have a, a, a special dinner event with, and having that close contact and frequent communication with, with, with people like, like this is uh, Sarah Grunberg from uh, Spiaggia. It's, it's important. So it takes time. And again, it's something you should consider in your, your business plan um, when, when you're designing uh, your, your, your marketing plan. So how to use the carcass. Um, like I say, a, a pig is a complicated sort of a biological assembly of muscles and bones and, and cartilage and sinew that you have to figure out how to separate the parts and get those parts to where the market deems them most desirable. And that, that is relatively complex, I have to say, but it is possible. And what I would say is that pig seems like, I know a lot of farms are selling half pigs and whole pigs, but I've, in my experience, if you want to break, to break out and get above that world, um, you need to learn how to break the carcass apart and understand what the pig is made up of. Because although it's ideologically desirable to sell only half pigs or whole pigs, I have found that the market for that is very small. And if you, if you want to get any kind of scale to your farm, you, you probably need to get to grow beyond that idea. And so another thing that's important is we have a fresh program. And I know that we could argue all day long about the benefits of freezing meat, um, but I have found that whether or not it's right, the, the general customer attitude towards frozen meat is that it's just kind of cheap, cheap meat. And you really are going, going to have a hard time getting value out of your animals if it's frozen. So what is the solution to that? It's as I've said, you have to get the right cuts to the right market to get the best price, um, rather than demanding your customers to use the whole animal only. Because although there are a few customers out there, I have a few customers who will do that. I have found that that is very limiting, and your customer, the audience, and the makeup of your customer base will dramatically shrink if you demand that they only use the whole carcass. So this is where it gets, again, philosophically, I'm sure there are people out there wringing their hands at what I'm saying, but it's what I've learned, that the organic farming world and the alternative food world is full of a lot of people who are very, um, you know, they're philosophical people, and I'm guilty of this. I could wax all day long about many aspects of this, but 
I have to make it work in reality. And this takes a degree of practical, a practical sort of approach to this problem. And <clears throat> so I would say, how, how do I ground my, my dreams in, in, into something that lets my farm survive? And something that I'm, like I say, I'm often told by my customers, um, yeah, don't worry, Jude, we, we'll use the whole carcass. We have a nose to tail butchery operation here. And I've seen this in national butch, uh, nationals uh, grocery store chains whose names you'd recognize. I've seen it at restaurants. I've seen people, I've witnessed people tell me this thing many times. They, they want to believe it, but then I find out that actually they're just buying, you know, a thousand pounds a week of uh, boneless loins from this farm and 500 pounds a week of tenderloins from that place and shoulders from this place. But they, they just keep saying, yeah, we believe in nose to tail butchery. So do I, but that doesn't seem to be what they're actually buying. So that's a hard, a hard thing to face. And um, the, the other thing that is so dangerous that you have to be aware of all the time is this idea that I've, I've been guilty of and, oh, I'll just put this in the freezer. I, I'll, I'll sell it later. Um, well, freezers have a funny way of filling up uh, much quicker than you think they will. And when that happens, what has happened to your economy is um, a tragedy because all of your, your investment has turned into this frozen meat. And the longer, longer it goes on, the worse the prospects become. So I'll just, and I'm sure some of you already know this, but I've experienced this the hard way. And so I, I really spare no, no effort in trying to sell everything now as fresh meat. So what is, I, I mentioned a bit about this already, but I'll just go over it again, the bi-weekly schedule for the farm. So each two weeks, uh, the pigs leave the farm on Monday, they get processed, and therefore we get continuous availability of fresh supply. Now, you might be able to go three weeks or a month, depending on um, your packing plant or your processing company's ability to cryovac correctly. But um, it, really, it really takes a high level of QA to go out go out more than two weeks, especially um, if you're dealing with bone-in product. I would say if you're if you have a boneless only program, then you could maybe have a less frequent schedule to process your pigs. But I do every two weeks. So again, just to repeat, uh, Monday is transport day and my customers, I tell them all that is the last day to order pork for the for this cycle. And Tuesday is the day of the kill day. Wednesday is the cut and pack day. Thursday, pork is shipped from my packing plant. And so then the following Monday, I have to take stock of what's going on. Um, and so I, I kind of start to start to amalgamate my orders. And so my, my uh, basically, I'm producing about 65 or 70 pigs every two weeks on my farm. And I, I look at the economics as the loin is something I can sell. It may be different for you, but for me, the loin is the most valuable thing. And I try to use that, those loin sales to drive decisions. So, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, I just made a mistake. So the, I said the following Monday. So this Monday is actually Monday of transport day is the last day to order. So that's the day I start gathering orders. And so the pigs leave the farm. And then here, let's just say, this is an example of what I might get from my customers. And in terms, so on the left is a column of uh, different cuts. And then we have the number of pieces that that generates. And sometimes I'm not going by pieces, I'm going by weight. And then the, the fourth column from the left is the number of animals it takes to, or the number of animals that those pieces are going to be gotten from. And then on the right is, is just my own notes, like what, where, where is this going? What customer has ordered this? And you, you guys could build something like this pretty quick in Microsoft Excel. So just this is an, an example of what I'm doing like right now. Uh, we make French racks. They're like uh, an eight bone rack that are that's French out. And then we, we, we make uh, bone and loins. And then the French racks go to Hong Kong 
uh, and the, the bone and loins go to Northern California. I know both of those are things for, are for retail, retail stores. I do some center cut boneless loins. That's the third item down from the top. We do a tender tenderloin baby back combo, which is derived off of the bone in loin. So that's the top top end of the loin off of those sales. Um, we do bone in butts. We do boneless picnics to two different locations. And then we do the orange line is uh, the bellies and the ribs. I have that together. Um, I'll tell you why later, but I have to keep those together like in my head. So I give them the same color. Um, then the, at the bottom in the green is hams. What am I doing with hams? So ham is 25% of the carcass, so it's important. So we have two ways to cut it up. We do bone in hams, uh, like one piece hams. And we also do the muscles that have all been boned out and put into a combo bean. And so the hams either go to a Midwest company who's making like a, like a torpedo net wrapped style ham. Uh, and then the bone in hams are going to the Bay Area. So in this case, we can just quickly go down the list and see the racks at the top. I, the Hong Kong customer ordered 48 pieces. So to make those um, racks, I need 24 animals allocated to that customer. And then my, my California stores, have ordered 44 pieces of bone and loins. And to do that, I needed 22 uh, animals because there's two, there's two loins per animal. And then the, another, another California customer has asked for boneless loins. And so they, they have ordered 22 pieces, but be, that only needs um, 11 animals uh, to make. And then, then out of, uh, out of that, we're doing tenderloins and baby backs. So that's another 11 animals. So if you add that all together, it's something like 60, maybe not, maybe not quite 60. We're a little short. So let's, let's skip ahead to the, if I put all that into my, I have another spreadsheet and I know this, I can forward this spreadsheet to people. I'm willing to share it freely, but I put the whole thing on this page. It may be a bit small to read, but if anyone wants it, I can send it off to you guys by email. But at the top is just the live weight of the hogs. And this is based on my, it could be either based on the average live weight that I've been getting lately or my desired live weight. It's two ways, however you want to calculate this out. So this is my target live weight, which is 270 pounds. And that has given me a carcass weight um, of about 177 pounds. So again, the left side of this, of this, of this spreadsheet is just showing the, all the different products I could get out of that animal. And then the second column from the right is the, the weight um, that I'm getting from those like 65 animals or 70 animals. And then the, this is the pieces, that, that, that column is not so important to, to, for this presentation, but that's just telling me how many pieces per head um, is, is possible to get. So an example would be the whole loin, you get two pieces of whole loin off of each animal. And then my, I've averaged all my prices. So the fourth column from the left is composite price, which means I've averaged out all the prices to all the customers. And so I know what I'm getting um, per, per pound for the whole loin, for example, is 549. So the weight, if you take the weight that I got from these animals times the price, then the total money I got from killing those, 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 let's say 65 to 70 pigs is on the right side. So then if you go down, all the way down on the, on the bottom, the total, the total uh, weight and total dollars coming in for the farm are, are sort of down like maybe two thirds of the way down the page. And that's your income from that event. So out of, out of two weeks, that's how much we could get if we sell all, all this meat, okay? And then the processing costs uh, would be underneath there. So for me, killing and cutting and packing, the, the, the total dollars for the farm, um, then the shipping charges that I know what they are, and then my, my delivery fee um, in California. So there I can figure out what it's costing me to process and deliver that stuff. And then really important after that is what's left over for the farm. So what do I have to cover my, the cost of 
feeding the animals and all of my other expenses, my own, my labor, uh, any, any fixed investments on the farm, equipment costs, veterinarians, straw, et cetera. So that's how much is left. And if I divide that number, I, I guess I must've divided by, I'm not sure what I divided by, but I, anyway, it turns out that right there, I'm getting a dollar and 11 cents a pound live weight uh, based on the stuff I had sold to those customers. Again, this is the first assessment I did after I filled all this in after I made my sales calls early in the week. And, but you can see that's not enough really, because I'd like to get more. I'd like to get like a dollar and 40 cents or more um, live weight. So what's going on? So I still need to sell based on my, my spreadsheet. Um, I'm, I haven't sold all the ham. And then, I, yeah, so I was saying, it looks like we're a little bit short on how many loins were sold. So we still have eight, eight animals to sell in this example. So what are we going to do about that? We have to sell it because putting it in the freezer sucks. And so what am I going to do? So I call the customers back something like later on Monday or maybe Tuesday in the morning and say, Hey, you know, can you guys help us out? We have a little bit more that's not sold. Uh, what's, what does your meat case look like today? And oftentimes once you get um, a butcher or a grocery store meat department manager to understand the critical aspect of this communication, they're very willing to make it, I've found. And so we were able to uh, talk to the people who bought the loin. And in, in this example, they, they agreed to buy those extra loins. Um, and so I, I already know right now that there's no, I, I, the shoulder markets for me are quite poor. So those things are a problem. Um, so what happened, ham customer accepted the overage, but he says his sales are weak, so try to reduce it next time. Um, again, that's not a perfect answer, but it's just it's what happened. Uh, loin customers, um, okay, sorry. I said I was trying to negotiate the sale, but they didn't want them. So, so what happened? So I, I put all that stuff in my cut sheet to the plant um, and I send that off on Tuesday afternoon. So that's the final time to make changes. To, so the packing plant has made a cut sheet for their customers. And then I, I know how much weight approximately is gonna come off of those orders. And I call these LTL companies and say, hey, we've got a pallet of, of this many cases of meat that needs to go to California. And we've got another pallet that's going to Chicago and maybe another one going to Texas. And I finalize all this on Tuesday. So now we do it now. I go th back through my thing, um, back through my master spreadsheet here, the farm doom and gloom e economics. And I look at what happened. So I was able to, I, th I think the ham customer agreed to take more, but the loin customer said no. So, and now it's, if you see at the very bottom right-hand corner, uh, we went up a little bit in my, what I might be able to get back to the farm, but maybe not enough. So what's, what am I gonna do about this problem? So I still have these, these loins unsold and sh shoulder products and trim is not sold. So unfortunately I said, never freeze anything, but in this case, I have to freeze it. So I have to assign some inventory value and send it to my cold storage. I have a, uh, there's a number like for, for us in Northwest Iowa, we work with AmeriCold. Uh, and they're, they're great people. Um, so I send the, the, the pork to AmeriCold where they, where they uh, put an ID tag on my pallets, my boxes of pork and put it into a freezer. And they give me a report saying, here's your stuff. Here's how much, how many pounds you have, how many boxes and the code numbers. And tell us when you want us to take it out. So what are the options at this point? So we don't want we don't want this to sit in the in the freezer very long. Uh, so I, there's a sausage company I I work with um, in California, and they are paying less than I want. Um, but you know, I, one of my one of the things I'm working at is making my own sausage brand. So in the future, I don't have this problem. But so now we have to figure out we figure out the price. So I I may I'm try, basically I would suggest like in this case this example scenario is making a deal with this sausage company um, to sell the meat 
like as soon as you can. And that's what, what I have been doing. Cause if you have to freeze the meat again, you're, it's just, it seems like in my experience, that's been a bad thing. Um, and I'm always the expectations I find of these kinds of companies is they want thousands and thousands of pounds of meat. And you have to try, at least I've tried to explain to them that's not very realistic for organic products or these small niche livestock meat products. So um, they have agreed to take it. And so we got everything sold except for, well, basically everything, but maybe the price wasn't the best. So the point, the point of all this um, is to try to show you how this might go down on my farm in the real world. Um, so on Wednesday afternoon, um, I, the packing plant gives me a report of what actually what you actually got from these pigs, um, which usually correlates pretty closely to the number of boxes I order. There might have been an example of an abscess, which would pro typically those occur in the loins, which would then mean that one of my customers got shorted a loin, a box of loins. That's not very often though. So I get that those reports back on Wednesday afternoon. And then I make, if we the plant has made export documents and gets them signed by a veterinarian. So for example, the pork that went to Hong Kong had to have an export document. So your plant needs to know how to do that and mine does. And that's signed by the USDA and that it's, it's basically attached to an invoice that I would make in QuickBooks. Um, that would probably also have the yield report that was specific for that customer. And then I, I, I send it off to the customer. So they might get that meat or they might get the meat about the same time the following Monday as the pork would arrive. So I've got that worked out, but it takes, it takes practice. And doing what I just said, that's basically an, an outline of my system, but you have to do this again and again and again, and by repetition and by mistakes happening, um, that's how you work these, these problems out. And um, so the problems that I've identified to you guys are loins, I have found are increasingly unpopular. Why that is, I'm not sure. They seem to have fallen out of favor with the American consumer. And I would say hams and bellies have become more popular, which is good. So my, my problem areas here that need to be worked out is trying to find more loin markets. And what am I gonna do? I've gotta go out and find, find new butcher shops, find new grocery stores, uh, meet with them, call them, send them samples. And maybe I just have to um, have a promotion at an existing customer. Um, for example, this week uh, we have um, these stores I have going on in, in, uh, in Hong Kong are having an American organic farm day and they're showcasing American farms. Uh, and they are, we, we have made a video for those guys and they're, they're playing in the, at the meat, meat counter. So that's just an example of something we happen to do uh, right now. Um, but one thing I'll caution you against is um, infinitely creating more and more customers might sound great, but actually it's not because that just creates increasing complexity for how many shipping routes and how many trucks you need and how many invoices you need to create. And so more customers is not always good. The customers need to be diverse. They need to be, uh, I would say, composing no, no more than 10 to 15% of your overall sales, because if you lose one, you can survive that. Um, you also need to look at the, the location in terms of available freight routes. I happen to be lucky, Hong Kong might sound crazy, but if you send stuff to this sort of industrial park west of O'Hare Airport, there's all sorts of freight forwarders specializing in sending um, high quality meat to Asia. So it, it, it is feasible. Um, so again, what are your expectations and attitudes? All this goes back to the beginning about, about making a plan. It's so important. Um, so yeah, this might seem complex and it kind of is, but it's something I've worked out over time. And again, by repeating this and learning, working out the kinks, you can, um, you can, you can make it better and better. And I, I'm one to sit down and draw out these, these flow, flow diagrams over and over. 
because I know that by doing this work, I can capture some of the value from the end consumer. And this is something that along with the nitty gritty I've just gone through of carcass use for me, I think it's so important as a farmer that you have got to find a way to capture this, the dollars from the end consumer. Because if you don't, then I think that you may cease to exist. Like if I, I, I couldn't exist, I know I couldn't exist without capturing these dollars um, further up the stream, you might say. Some people call it vertical integration or something like that, but you've got to get those dollars back to your farm. And I know it goes back again to, to what, what is farming? Because the, the traditional view is that what I'm doing is complicated and it's not farming. But I would say that the traditional view is farmers just sell their animals or their grain or their milk to a middleman who then does all this work. But the problem is by doing that, uh, as a farmer, we've, we've taken, we've got, become uh, weaker and we have to accept less and less money for our skilled labor. And I would say that a new view I see out there and when I, um, the view I've, I've taken on board is that you have to um, spend some of your time, a significant amount of your time working on, on this marketing concept uh, to get a, a living wage to yourself as a farmer. Otherwise, I, I, for me, I, it's hard to see how I could exist. Um, so that's, that's my presentation. And I'm not sure how much time we have left, but if anyone has some questions, I could, I could try to try to address them. I know there's a lot of complicated stuff in that spreadsheet, but. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jude, for sharing all of these insights. I, I, there's a few people here that have said that this was very helpful. Um, so thank you for, for sharing everything in detail. Sarah with Cannon Valley Butcher's Block said, are you using 65% yield then when you are calculating your numbers? Yeah, so we're using about 66% yield. And the reason for that is I, the plant we work with is a skinning uh, plant. So they don't have a scalder. So in other words, they have to pull off the entire hide. And when you do that, your yield is not as high as if you leave the skin on. Okay. Um, Sarah, feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions, but... Um or anyone else for that matter, feel free to unmute yourself or type in your other questions. I had a question for you, Jude. So you mentioned that, um, you know, your Northern California uh, customer and your Hong Kong customer represent about 15% of your business. Is that accurate? Is that, did I understand that correctly? So, so let me clarify that. I. I think I might have said that I try not to let any one customer get more than 10 or 15 percent of my overall business. But um, in Northern California, I have a lot of customers. And so I would say Northern California is like the center of what we do. It's probably 75 percent of all of my sales. But that there are many customers there. And we have one distributor in San Francisco who takes who, who, who takes my pork every, every two weeks and they just charge me a delivery fee. And I, I can contact and communicate directly with every restaurant, every grocery store and take their order and they pay me. They don't pay the distributor. Gotcha. Yeah, so I, but, that, but why is that, why you might ask, is that interesting to a distributor? It's interesting to them because they can, I allow them to make their own sales. And so they can, they can um, buy from me sometimes and then grow their own business that way. And, and for us, it's been able to, because we're, we have been able to create a pretty well-recognized brand in San Francisco, it gives them access to the back door of restaurants they might not otherwise have access to. Um, and so I think for them, it's been, there's some value there. 
Very interesting. And so as far as like your direct to consumer channel, would that be your online store? Would that be your primary direct to consumer? Yeah, we, we have starting last year, um, made a foray and it, a, a bit of an adventure it's been into online selling of meat. And so far I have to say it's been challenging. Um, we, we have found a place in Wisconsin who does that for us. They, they take, they take uh, meat from my packing plant, like whole primals, for example, and they break these like loins into pork chops. They break the shoulders down into small roasts. They can make ground pork. It all sounds really cool. Um, but for me, getting, getting customers for that has been quite a challenge. Um, I thought using Facebook and, and Instagram and that seems like lots of people are doing it. It seems easy, but it's, it's actually been, it's been hard to get, to get people to buy any serious quantities that way. We've got some customers buying that way, but it's very small and sporadic and it mm -hmm. makes not, sense. Not consistent, basically. Yeah. yeah. So, so I would say that has been something that's pretty hard for us. And we still rely totally on, on these grocery stores who order every two weeks and we have regular relationships with. Yeah. Understandable. Uh, ben Caldwell with Moza said, lots of super helpful info, Jude, thank you. Um, Kara C said, really appreciated your thoughts on philo philosophy and producing pork rather than pigs. Thank you for sharing today. Um, Ch Chuck Anderas with Moses said, thanks Jude, what kind of training or education have you had or would you recommend to be able to develop these kinds of systems. Yeah, it, um, it takes time. And uh, one thing that I think everyone raising pigs needs to do is spend more time at their processing plant because you would not believe how many opportunities are going, going on unutilized and un, just wasted opportunities. Like as a farmer, again, I never spent much time in a packing plant. Why would I do that? I mean, geez, they're, they're doing a good job. Let them, let them do it, right? But actually, nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, and you, you, uh, the more time I spend there, I was realizing once that there was a whole, like this shoulder muscle that was going into trim and being sold off cheaply that I could have sold to a restaurant for a lot more money. And I had to be there to actually physically notice that before I realized, uh, aha, that's an opportunity. And so learning this process is so important. Um, yeah. Just kind of, in a sense, having that behind the scenes experience at the processing yeah. facility and really seeing yeah. what's happening. That's, that's very insightful. Uh, Mike uh, says, it was great to hear the intricacies of selling the whole hog in a timely manner. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience. Awesome. Well, you guys, uh, if there are, oh. mm -hmm. I have a bunch of questions. I'll contain myself. Um, I guess one, what scale did you feel that you needed to be at with how many hogs you could finish bi-weekly to go to a fresh program? What do you do with your fat and bones? So we have uh, about a hundred sows at the farm and um, that's kind of where, where I am. And I would say, depending on your plant, you could be, you could be a bit smaller than that, but it really depends on the willingness of your plant and what size, what batch sizes they want to harvest at a time. So if the batch size is 40 pigs or 50 pigs or 75 pigs or hundred pigs, um, I and that to some people, but, but, um, if, if you have, if you have a locker plant who was willing to do 10 pigs at a time, I mean, may, maybe then, you know, it, again, it, the, the size is, I think it's, 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 maybe it's a mistake for me to talk about size because size is, it's always relative and re it's relative to what your farm is. It's relative to what your, what your processor wants to do. It, it, that's just my, my answer to that question might not be your answer. I mean, I think the key is you have to make everyone happy. Your processor has to be happy your customer has to be happy and you have to be happy. And you just need to play with the numbers until it works for everyone. Bones and fat? 
Bo oh, sorry, bones and fat. But uh, fat, we have a customer. I could go back to. Um, so I think okay. So if you go way down there, and I don't can, even brace on you, there. Can you zoom in on this page, uh, Jude? It doesn't really show the words very clearly. Can you zoom in on it? Yeah. So I don't know how to zoom in actually. Okay. Okay. But I can forward this to any. I can forward this spreadsheet to anyone. But the point is, we're selling our fat mostly to like one one trick I've learned is to make a deal with someone who's a volume user. And on these things like trimmings and fat, oftentimes they're not too too fussy about if they're ten percent short or twenty percent short. And so we have a, a customer who's making organic lard. Okay. And I send, I have a deal with them where I sell the fat at a pretty cheap price to, for them. And it's okay for me. It's way higher than, than the commodity value of this fat. Okay. So, and if I have a customer like a chef who wants a box of back fat, I have two codes in my, my cut sheet. So I have one code number for big bulk boxes of back fat. And most of it's done that way for this customer who makes lard. So I know it's all, it's all going to be sold. Okay. But if I have these sporadic orders coming here and there from customers who want just, oh, we just need a box of fat to make something special, I can charge a much higher price, like like probably double of what I might get paid from the, the organic lard maker. And I can then rob a little bit away, like a box or two of stuff, as long as it's not more than 10 or 20%, and they, they don't care. Um, so I have those, those two codes one for one for bulk fat and one for like a box with maybe three 20 pound bags inside the box or something like that. And it's like little opportunities like that, that you need to learn how to exploit to make, to make money on this. Um, another example, oh, sorry, you said bones. Um, bones right now, we don't sell many bones. The, the plant takes them back and we don't get much out of the bones. Um, we, we found a ramen shop a ramen, a ramen uh, restaurant in, in Oakland that was buying bones, but they stopped buying them. I don't know why. So I'll stop talking. You can ask the rest of your questions. Just, and also for reference, I am there previously at Lawrence Meats. Um, we worked on your sausage line. Okay. Uh, okay. I recognize you. Yeah. Good. Good to see you, Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. I now have my own organic, well, organically fed um, pork and butchery education business. Great. And I'm definitely at that point where I'm trying to finish 50 this year and I'm doing holes and halves and I'm trying to transition into direct sales through e commerce. And I think, you know, what you just said is so perfect. I have a pallet in the freezer with bones and fat on it, and it's stupid. <laughs> so it's like it's hard because you've 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 invested your own emotional energy into that meat. That 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 sounds silly, but it's that's how it is, and that's what's causing this to happen. Something is always better than nothing, and that's hard for us to accept. And when when you sometimes when you have something in the freezer, you just need to accept this has fallen through the net. I didn't want it to fall through the net, but it has fallen through the net. And what am I going to do? Because it's going to become a liability and make me lose money. You have to just clean it out, clean it up, whatever you want to, however you want to phrase this ideologically. But you just need to sell it even if it's for not a lot of money, because if you're always way better off because I was just looking through the freezer charges I had for this year so far. And it's not even, the year's not even half over and it's thousands and thousands of dollars in freezer charges. Like that's money I could use to invest in my farm, you know? And so I, I sold all that stuff, but even with, even with this idea of selling it pretty fast, it still adds up so fast to freezer charges. Oh my goodness. So with the with this program, you you're really focused m mostly on a wholesale market, um, with just starting to kind of dip your toe into a retail market. Is another scale question? Do you feel like there's a scale threshold that makes wholesale versus retail 
doable? Yeah. Um, for me, or because I'm organic, I find that <clears throat> that's where you're going to be able to capture recognition for organic is at a retail supermarket where someone walks along a meat shelf and sees the organic logo. That's valuable. If you're selling to restaurants, restaurants are a little more dodgy. I'm sorry, but they are. They, they, they don't have to, their, their menus are very nebulous. And, and, and so we focus on, on, on wholesale um, supermarkets. But when you say retail, if you mean me selling direct to customers, um, yeah, if I, if I had more time to, to go out, I, honestly, I don't know what the formula is. I just have to confess, I don't know what the answer is to getting these online buyers to start buying because I thought I could figure it out and I've seen other people do it. Um, we priced it down to be competitive with other, other people, but I think it just takes it just takes a long time to develop that online customer base who is going to be a repeat, repeat, repeat buyer. And I don't have the answer. Maybe you, maybe you have the right formula there. Um, maybe I don't know. <laughs> maybe if you're smaller, it's probably easier. Yeah. It's, that's the trick. You know, everyone's competing at this point to be e-commerce and to garner members in a, you know, a subscription or uh, in consistent orders and you know, I've scaled up and I'm ready to go that route, but that, that is the question. Will will people yeah. order enough? Yeah, my, my, my Facebook page has about 2,000 followers and for the farm. And I was running these ads and spending serious money with Facebook, like $100 an ad and some of these big blow up ads and getting back three or four orders at a time and not, they were small orders. And, and I was, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying you, you might have a different experience. I don't really know what the metrics are there. Someone probably could speak to that better than I can, but it's been challenging for us. What do you do with your 42 versus, is that that percentage 42 versus 72 yeah, trim? So, that, so that's 42 trim. So that has, has a very, iffy history one time we found a customer that was using that in card in like wax line boxes to make sausage um and they didn't want organic they just wanted something from a small farmer who they knew they said we just want a farmer who we can call and that they're doing their chores when we call them i found that to be an interesting concept but um but now i have now you can see i've got nothing i've got zero there because i'm not selling it so some of these things you might find customers for us sometimes, but I wouldn't budget. I would make these budgets. This spreadsheet's the center of what I do. And I would not, um, I would be conservative when you build this about awful items because when you can sell those, it's awesome. But a lot of the times you can't sell them. Have you ever reached out to any restaurants or re grocery retailers in the Des Moines Metro? Um, so Iowa, we have, in Iowa, we have spent some time in Iowa City, Des Moines, and Ames trying to do this. Um, and I, the problem is I, ha I did not talk about critical mass. I had another four or five slides with how many customers in a geographic area, and then my shipping cost weight, like the averaged out cost per pound of shipping. And the problem I found in Iowa, and this is just me, maybe it's someone else has great success, okay? But that the customers are too few with too many miles between them and that not enough, not enough weight of meat is moving. And so when I, when I was able to break into like Northern California, the San Francisco area, you've got, for me again, many customers and a lot of weight. And so when you divide out the shipping costs, it's actually pretty cheap. It was actually costing me a lot more money to send pork to Iowa City from Sioux City than it was for me to send pork to San Francisco per pound. And that's something that really can, can kill a small pig farm is too much freight cost on the meat. Makes sense. Well, I have a million more questions. I have to run for another meeting. And so maybe I'll try to catch up with you another day, but thank you for doing this. You're welcome.
Thanks for being here, Sarah. And thanks everyone else that joined today. We won't keep you. I know we are running about five minutes past the one o'clock hour. Um, as always, you are welcome to reach out to me or to Jude. Uh, you know, for additional questions and, you know, I'm more than happy, Jude, if you can send me the presentation, more than happy to share the presentation with anyone else that is interested to have a copy of it. Um, but thank you again, everybody for being here today. And thank you, Jude, for this incredible presentation and for all your, your hard work. Uh, uh, and uh, we are very appreciative of you being here today. Thank you. And what I will do, you guys, is I will send, I will post this on our YouTube channel. So if, if you are not already subscribed to our YouTube, feel free to do so to stay in the loop of all of our webinars. In addition, I will also uh, share a survey link. Uh, please, if you can, uh, fill it out. It will only take you a few minutes. Um, we use your answers for our grant reporting purposes, and we really appreciate your feedback. All right. Well, thanks again, guys. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.